I am quite excited about the message today. We're going to be looking actually at chapters 46 and 47. We looked at 45 last weekend. We do this every Sabbath and Sunday. And uh, today, because 45, I'm sorry, 46 and 47 are fairly short, I'm going to try to get through both of them. That means I'm going to have to read a lot of scripture, but I think it, they will come through because some of what's happening in chapters 46 and 47 are similar to what's already happened in previous chapters. There are some new thoughts, though, and some thoughts that might have to challenge our minds a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and look now at what the Bible is saying. The Bible says in chapter 46, Bell boweth down. Now, bowing down, we have to understand why are we talking about bowing down? Well, it's actually because what we have here in this context is that previously in our study, we were looking to the father and his son, right? I have sworn by myself, God says, and the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness. So we recalled last time when he swore by himself, there was nothing greater for him to swear by in the book of Hebrews. And so he swore by himself, this is the father. And the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. And we heard that word through the life of his son on our side of this. But of course, this is a prophecy about also Christ coming to declare the righteousness of his father. You can read more about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And it says, and it shall not return unto him void, as it says later in chapter 55. But then every knee shall bow, right? And every tongue shall swear. This verse is actually picked up in Philippians, but we know that in Philippians, it's actually describing the idea of every knee bowing to Christ, to the glory of the Father. So everything goes to the Father. All things are of the Father, and that's really what Christ is trying to do, is to bring us to the Father anyways. Because it says in John chapter 14, verse 6, that Jesus said, I am the way. The way to what? I am the truth. The truth about what? No man comes unto the Father but by me. And so the way and the truth is the way and the truth about the Father, or the way to the Father, the truth about the Father. So the idea of every knee bowing, it's really to the Father through the Son. So we bow to the Son, to the glory of the Father, right? And so I bow to both. I bow to the Father and I bow to the Son, because ultimately God the Father is my God, and the Son of my God is also the Prince, or you can call him the Prince of Peace, the, um, the Comforter, he's the, the life expressed by the Father, or the, manifest, uh, the manifestation of God the Father, all these things. And we bow to both. We worship the Father, we worship his Son. And that's the thing, is at the end of time, the devil's trying to get you to worship the beast and his image, whereas we're called to worship the Father in his image. And so this is an end time, third angel's message scenario that we're talking about in this concept of who God is. And that's what Isaiah is dealing with. We're talking about bowing down. Bell is bowing. Well, who's Bell? Let's go ahead and look at that for a second. So we have this idea there in <clears throat> Isaiah 46, Bell bows down. Nebo stoops. Well, who is Bell and who is Nebo? Watch this. If you triple click in this program and you go to and find the dictionary, you go to Easton's Bible Dictionary and you look for this word bell, okay? Bell is the Aramaic form of Baal. Oh, okay. We've heard of Baal before, right? But Bell is kind of a new thought. Well, it's just because it's a different language. It's the national god of the Babylonians. And so Bell is bowing down. Whoa! So you mean the god of the Babylonians is bowing down? Well, yeah, you're going to kind of see why in just a moment. But it signifies Lord. Okay, so that's what Bell signifies, the Lord. And then Nebo, if I were to copy this word here and put it into my Easton Bible Dictionary search, I'd be able to find that Nebo means proclaimer or prophet. And so you have the Lord and his prophet. Whoa, you know what that sounds like to me? It sounds a little bit like at the end of time where you have the Father and his Son, or the Lord and the manifestation of the Lord of Heaven, or the God of Heaven. And so it sounds like the beast in his image in the Old Testament, or like an impersonation of the Father in his image. You have Bel and Nebo, the Lord and his prophet. Okay, so that's what I'm gathering from this. Anyways, what we're seeing is 
Bell bows down and Nebo stoops. Their idols were upon the beasts. Whose idols? Well, we're talking about actually the idols of those that God was trying to get away from idolatry. It was the seed of Israel, right? The seed of Israel that we've been talking about for all these previous chapters have been condemned for idolatry. Bel, a false god, and Nebo, a false prophet, are their idols. And they were upon beasts. Why were they upon beasts? Because we learned before that the, the idols that you make with gold and silver with your hands and you, you cut down a tree, you warm yourself with that tree, but then you fix yourself some food with the burnt parts of that tree. And then you fashion that tree and then you cover it with gold and silver and then you worship it, right? So that's really quite foolish. And so that's what Isaiah is trying to bring out. Well, idolatry is foolish. God's people have been involved in idolatry for many years. And so here, their gods, their false gods, Bel and Nebo, they're on beasts. Why are they on beasts? Because they can't walk for themselves. They're not living gods. And so the living God and his son is what we're supposed to be worshiping instead of the beast and his image or Bel and Nebo. I hope you're getting what I'm throwing down here. So it says, the idols were upon the beasts and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy. They were heavy loaden. Why? Because Nebo and Bel are big. They're trying to, you know, you, you got to make big idols. You can't make little tiny ones. They are a burden to the weary beast. That's all these false gods are. They're just a burden to animals. They stoop. They bow down together. They could not deliver the burden. So the animals are stooping. The animals are bowing down together. Together with what? Together with Bel and Nebo. Why? Because, I mean, think about it for a second. If you're a beast that is heavy laden, you're not going to have your shoulders up and keeping everything straight. You're going to be bent down like this and, and the idols on your back are going to be bowing down and, and perhaps even falling off. I'm not sure what the extent is of them bowing down. But that's the idea that I'm gathering because of these beasts here that don't have the ability to uphold these false idols in the way that they would rather be upheld. So they stoop, they bow down, they could not deliver their burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. Who are themselves? Well, probably the beasts and also these idols, Bel and Nebo. Why have they gone into captivity? Because God has promised not only the Assyrian captivity, as we had talked about before, but now we're talking about Babylonian captivity as well. We're actually going more into the future here in Isaiah, uh, dealing with the future uh, destruction of the kingdom of Judah and how the Babylonians are going to come to them. Hearken unto me, it says, O house of Jacob. Now, remember, Jacob is a deceiver, but that deceiver was converted into the overcomer Israel. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly. Okay, this is that part where I was saying we're going to have to think a little bit differently here. Which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. Now, just to be fair, this by me, you can see, is italicized. I am using the King James Version of the Bible. And every time the King James Version of the Bible uses italicized words, it's because these words are not in the original, in this case, Hebrew. And the reason why they are italicized is because the translators tried to make them uh, make the section better understood by placing some of these words in there to try to help it make sense. Well, it's kind of hard to get away from the idea that Christ, or I'm sorry, God is saying through his son here, because all things come from the Father through the Son, and God communicates with man through his son and angels. And so what we're seeing here is the Father and his son demonstrating that Jacob and Israel, you've been carried by me in the womb. Now, does God the Father have a womb? Does he have a belly whereby he carries his people? I would say no. Okay, that's just what I'm going to say, but I'll find out more in heaven. I'm going to say no, but, you know, hey, all things are possible. I'm just saying that, you know, I'm not going to, you know, put God in this box that he has to be female, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, male, and he can't have certain, you know, aspects of his um, body, whatever. I'm, I'm just saying that I don't know. I frankly don't. But right here it's saying that in this phrase, God has a womb or a belly whereby to carry people. Well, let's think about that for a second. How is a human, Jacob or Israel, how are they born again? So 
in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus was speaking to Christ, he was saying, does a man hop back into his mother's womb and, and be born again? Well, no. Jesus was like, no, 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 no. That's not what it is at all. You need to be born of the Spirit. And how are you born of the Spirit? Well, let's find out from the Bible and try to understand a little bit more about being born of the Spirit. I'm going to say, born Spirit Jesus. Uh, okay, Jesus. There's a couple of verses. Jesus answered and said, Except a man be born of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, there's only two verses that actually have this idea. If you preach another Jesus, you're going to receive another Spirit, and you're going to receive another Gospel. Okay, so that's really not talking about it. But what about born again? Word. You can be born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So you can be born again by the Word of God. Now, we haven't done all the searches possible with being born again, but born again by the Word is really probably the most applicable for us as humans in this context. We can be born again by the Word of God. Okay, so the very Word of God that we're reading right now the, the, the Bible, so this, this book right here, this is God's word to us. And he has offered us this word so that we can be born again of the Spirit. Now, why would a new heart be given to us? Why would a new spirit be given to us? Because all of us need a good brain washing, right? We need a good cleansing of our spirit or our heart. We need a brain cleansing. And so the heart and the spirit are synonymous with the mind, and so a new mind you will get if, in fact, you receive the Word of God. God's Word can bear you again, can cause you to be born again. Why? Because you'll be given a new mind, new motives, new character, new thoughts, new uh, desires, new cravings, new direction in your life. All those things come from your mind, your thoughts, your will, and your desire. So that's what God is promising here to give us. And so when it's saying, well, I want you to hearken unto me, Jacob and Israel. So Jacob was born again to become Israel. You were born of me from the belly. You were carried of me from the womb. So I believe this is referring to a spiritual being born again, not a physical aspect of God's body. Okay, so I'm just saying we can learn more as we continue to study. Anyways, verse 4. Even to your old age, I am he that does what? Even unto your hoary hairs, will I carry you? Now, the whore hairs just mean gray hairs, okay? Like the Bible says, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the ways of righteousness. You can see that in the Proverbs. I don't remember exactly which one, but it says, I have made and I will bear. I will even carry and I will deliver you. So even to your old age, I will carry you. I will carry you and deliver you no matter what age you are. So, Jacob, if you lived to be 45 and you finally wanted to be born again, you would become Israel at 45. Jacob, if you lived to be 86 years old and you wanted to be born again, then at 86 years old, Jacob, I would bear you again so that you can be born again as Israel. I think that this is what this is talking about. No matter how long you go on in your Jacob experience, I will carry you. I will hold you. I will give you life. I will sustain you. I will cause the sun to shine upon both the unrighteous and the righteous. I will cause the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust as long as you're willing to live. And if there's an opportunity, I will carry you until you will be born again, no matter how long it takes. Even to your old age, I am he even the one that will carry you until you have gray hair. I have made you, I will bear you, I will carry you, and I will deliver you no matter how long it takes. So if you have a different idea of what that's saying in this section, then please afterwards, you know, write that down and let me know. I'd love to learn more. But I think that to me, it, it, it makes good sense that God is willing to bear with us as long as we are Jacob. As long as there's a hope for us to become Israel, he will carry us as long as it takes. 
Some folk I know I've met in the past are 80 years old and they become Christian. I'm studying with somebody right now on a weekly basis on Thursday nights that's 80 plus years old. And this person is really seeing the truth in the book of John. We're just going through the book of John verse by verse. And he, it's opening his eyes. He's really quite inspired. In fact, after like 20 or 30 Bible studies, he's finally interested in going out to buy his own Bible for himself. So like, this is a long journey for this guy, but he's he keeps coming. He's, he's still interested. He wants to learn more. He's got questions. And I think that's what God is doing here in this section. So... Anyways, I'm willing to learn, like I said, if, if you have some other ideas. Verse 5. To whom will you liken me and make me equal? We've already talked about this. There is nobody. You cannot compare me with anybody that we may be like. There is none. There is one God, and that's it. Now, that one God has a son, and he has been made equal with the Father. You can read that in Hebrews chapter 2. And he was given life by the Father in John chapter 5, verse 26. But there is nobody who is like God. There is nobody. He's the only one that has foresight or uh, foreknowledge. And it says, they lavish gold out of a bag. Is that what you're going to compare me with? No. They weigh silver in the balance. And they hire a goldsmith so that he can make a god. Is that what you're going to compare me with? Well, no, you shouldn't. They fall down and worship that. But that is so foolish. We've already read in previous chapters. They bear him upon the shoulder, which is they're carrying their god. And they carry him and set him up in a place and he stands there. From his place, he's not going to move. Why? Because he doesn't have any legs. Not to walk with, anyways. Yea, one shall cry unto him. They're going to pray to this God, but he can't answer. Nor can he save out of his trouble, because he's not a living God like I am, God is saying. Remember this, and show yourselves men. Now, God doesn't say remember about a lot of things. He says remember the Sabbath day. You can read that in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. But here it's saying, remember this. Remember what? Remember that idolatry doesn't help a single person. It won't save anybody. It will not save him. That's what he just said. Idolatry will not save you. The, idolatry can't answer your prayers. It doesn't help you. In any, it doesn't feed you. It doesn't do anything. Remember this. So remember the Sabbath day, but also remember idolatry is foolishness. And show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O oh, you transgressors. How are they transgressors in this section? They are committing idolatry. And if we are worshiping anything contrary to God's word, we are frankly idolaters. And we will be, we will be worshiping the beast and his image instead of the father and his image. So really, this is end time scenario that we're dealing with here in Isaiah. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I'm going to underscore that because it's so true. I am God and there is none like me. Now, certainly he has a son and that son has the same authority. But there are things that son does not have that the father has. Now, what do I mean by saying that? Really, Daniel, are you saying that? Well, yeah, sure. The father has experience that the son does not have. The father was around in existence before the son was brought forth from the father and the son had no decisions to make in regard to that being begotten. The son didn't say of himself, you know, I want to be begotten. So father, I think it'd be a good idea that you bring me forth. It, it didn't happen that way. And the counsels between them both, why if they both knew everything, would there need to be counsels? It would actually be like uh, metaphorical, really. But it's not metaphorical, it was a real thing. The father had plans that he revealed to his son, and his son's business, or his son's opportunity, was to either accept or reject this, the, the offer that the father had made. Now both, I think the son could have brought some things to the father, and the father would have made some decisions about it as well. But the father was the one that gave all things to the son. You can read that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. So the father has more than the son in experience, the Bible only says God the Father has foreknowledge. It never says that Christ does. And so we can go on and on. There's a lot of other things as well. And so the Father is the only one that we can call, in all honesty, the only true God. Just ask Jesus. He's the one that said that to us in John 17, verse 3. And so I am God and there is none like me. Now, of course, the Son of God is like him, but there's none in his position. And I think that's what's being described here. Now, what is being said here? There is no God like me. There is none else. Why? Because declaring the end from the beginning. In other words, God is saying, I have foreknowledge. 
You can ask Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Peter says that it's the foreknowledge of God the Father. And so here, there's one God that has the ability to declare the end from the beginning. This is God the Father. From ancient times, the things that are not yet done. God the Father has the ability to prophesy. And guess what? God the Father reveals things to his Son, as it describes in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And the Son gives it to an angel, and the angel brings it down to the prophet, and the prophet writes it down, and then you have it, just like we have it in God's Word today. We got those things from that process. God gave it to his son, and in some cases the son gave it directly to the prophets, like for example to Moses. I believe that God was able to interact with Moses. I also believe that God was able to interact with uh, Abram, or the son of God was able to interact with Abram. You can read that like John, I'm sorry, Genesis uh, 18 and 19, for example, when they interacted in um, Sodom and Gomorrah, where Christ interacted with Abraham or Abram at the time. But you can also know that uh, Moses was able to interact face to face with um, Christ, and that was in the sanctuary, in the temple. But then, you know, you look up that phrase face to face, and you maybe can understand some different things about that too. We won't go into it now because it's a little bit deeper, but I'll just go on and say that <clears throat> God is the only one that can declare things from the beginning or things that have not been done yet. And he does that for us through his son, saying, my counsel, that's the counsels of peace. My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east. Now, I wonder, this ravenous bird from the east, is it the just parallelism when he's saying, the man that executes my counsel from a far country? Is the ravenous bird from the east the man that executes my counsel from a far country? I think it is. And no wonder the uh, previous pioneers thought that the ravens that were helping Elijah were actually people from the east, okay? The, you can find that, just look up the ravens and the people from the east in the pioneers' writings, and you'll see that they didn't think it was birds, they thought it was actually the uh, people from the east. Anyways, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Why? Because he is God. Amen? Hearken unto me, you stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. And that's what God is doing here, is he's calling people to repentance. Hearken unto me, you people that need a new heart. You are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. How do you do that, God? Well, you do it by sending your Son. You describe that all through the New Testament. It shall not be far off. In other words, he's going to be doing it soon. This was only 700 years before Christ came. And my salvation shall not tarry. I will do it in the right time. And that's why, of course, it says in, it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, at the perfect time, God sent forth his Son. And that's what we're reading here. And by the way, that's why later this, this phrase, God sent forth his Son, it's so important to understand because later, two verses later, it says God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son. And that's why, you know, even Sister White was able to say, we want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ in letter 66. And so I bring my righteousness near. How do you do that? By sending your Son. My salvation shall not tarry. I'm going to send it at the right time. I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, who is my glory, right? So God is going to send his son for Zion, for Israel, for my glory, or Israel is his glory, especially if we accept the message that his son had sent on this side of his son coming. But before that, they were supposed to accept the uh, sacrificial system and the ceremonies and understand that God was serious when he said he was going to reveal his righteousness and send salvation. Okay, chapter 47, verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Now, I'll just say that Jeremiah chapter 6 describes the child of God, which is the daughter of Zion, as a meek and comely virgin. Now, we just read that Babylon here is referred to as the virgin, right? So Israel in Isaiah 6 is referred to as a virgin, but we know that that section of Jeremiah really condemns that virgin, the daughter of Zion. 
And so it's just interesting how they're both called the virgins and they both are called daughters. And there's just a, a personation. You can see that also in Revelation chapter 17 and 21. I have a message on this if you're interested. There's a lot of comparisons between the New Jerusalem and the city of Babylon. They're both called great cities and there's a whole bunch of parallelism there. But you can see also that the Virgin of Babylon and the Virgin of, of uh, Zion are very similar as well. So here's this idea. Come down and sit in the dust, you virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, so the Babylonians. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Wait a minute. You know, I'm just going to read that one because it's like Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman, right? And so it goes on and says, we're going to destroy that woman. That's basically what's happening is Zion is, is under attack in this section. She's not glorified as this beautiful Zion woman that's uh, praised at this section. She's about to be destroyed. And so here we're seeing that this virgin daughter, Babylon, is no longer tender and delicate, kind of like what happened with this virgin daughter over in Jeremiah chapter 6. You ought to compare those two. It's pretty amazing. Take the millstones. Wait a minute. Millstones? That's what Revelation 18 talks about in verse 22. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover the locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh. This lady is going to be naked where the shame of her nakedness is going to be before everybody. She's going to pass over the rivers, which is probably the Nile River, dealing with, you know, they were crossing over the river all over the Old Testament. I heard a sermon on that once and it was really powerful. I wish I had the notes to that one. Anyways, verse 3. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. The shame of your nakedness will be seen. And that's like, for example, in Revelation chapter 16, I think it's 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Yes, it is. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments. Why? Lest he walk naked and they shall see his shame. And so right here in the middle of the plagues, this is the sixth plague, God is saying that you need to be covered because you don't want the shame of your nakedness to be shown, right? And that's what we're seeing here is your nakedness shall be uncovered. You're going to be naked in front of everybody. Take the millstones, right? Remember the millstone is going to be hung around Babylon's neck and the nakedness and all these things. And you are going to be taken vengeance upon. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame will be seen and I will take vengeance upon you. I will not meet you as a man, but rather as someone who's grieved, right? Not as somebody who's a gentleman. I'm going to be coming as a judge. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Now, so you're going to be like, okay, this is Christ, right? Well, yes, in a sense, Christ is our Redeemer. Why? Because his father sent him to be our redeemer. Because his father planned as the great redeemer to send his son so that we would be redeemed. Now, so Christ is our savior, but why? Because the father sent him to be our savior. The father is our ultimate savior. The father is our ultimate redeemer. The father is our ultimate guide. The father is everything to us. How? Through his son. And so here we're seeing that the Father is our Redeemer. How does he do that? Through his Son. He's, he's already promised to send that earlier in the previous chapter, right? He's the Lord of hosts. Well, yeah, the Father is the Lord of hosts, ultimately. But the Father, I believe, has given the angelic ministry into the hands of his Son. So the Father is the Lord of hosts. But how does he do that? Through his Son. The Father is our Redeemer. How does he do that? Through his Son. The Father is the Holy One of Israel. How does he do that? Through his Son. I believe everything here is referring to the Father, and it is because the Father is doing all things through his Son. Now, some could apply this to the Son, and I, I wouldn't condemn them for it, because I know what's happening in their minds, but I think one step further back is that this is the Father. But yeah, you could refer this to the Son if you wanted to, and, and I'm not going to throw stones at you. I just think that maybe we would come to a little bit of a difference, but I'm not going to say that you're going to hell because you think that this is Christ. And I hope you wouldn't think that I'm going to hell because I think this is the Father. We may understand this a little bit differently, but perhaps one day my mind will click and I'll say, well, you know what? This is Jesus. It's not the Father. Maybe one day your mind will click and you're going to say, you know what? This is not Jesus. This is the Father. So hopefully we'll be able to grow together. I have understood at this point that this is referring to the Father through his Son. Okay? 
So now it says there in verse 5, Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. You know what? Isaiah talks about how the daughter of Zion was actually given into the hands of the Chaldeans. I think it's in this chapter. We might see it. And uh, maybe it's somewhere else. I don't remember. Anyways, for thou shalt no more be called the lady of kingdoms. Why? I was wroth with my people. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> this is crazy. So, okay, you're the daughter of the Chaldeans. And I have a daughter of Zion, God is saying, but it's saying, I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance, which is his people. And I have given my people, given them, which is my people, which are the, the daughter of Zion. I have given the daughter of Zion into your hand. Who is your hand? O daughter of Chaldeans. So what is this saying? This is a prophecy of Judah. And Judah is going to be given. Judah is God's people. God, Judah is like the place where his name is. Judah is where Jerusalem is, where the temple is, where God's name is, where like the most holy thing in the universe is. Well, not the universe, but on this earth is. Okay, so let's try it again. Um, let me see if I can remember all these things. In the Bible, there was a holy land, and that holy land was in Judah, and that holy land was called Jerusalem, which was in Judah, and in Jerusalem, there was a holy uh, temple, or holy mount, really, and on that holy mount, there was a holy city, and in that holy city, there was a holy temple, and in that holy temple, there was a holy place. But inside that holy place, there was a most holy place. And there was only one thing that talked about holiness in all of that holy experience. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? Because because of that Sabbath, you will honor the God of heaven, the one true God that created all things through his Son. And so that one holy thing points us to the Father, points us to his son so that we can spend time with them and become like them. And so what God has done is he's taken his virgin daughter of Zion and he's given them into the hands of Babylon. And so now who are they? Are they still God's people or are they Babylonians? I think you need to wrestle with that and you need to understand what's happening here. God's people have been given into the hands of the Babylonians. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean every one of them have lost their soul and they're all going to hell with Babylon? No, that doesn't mean that. Because God has always had a remnant. And that remnant are the ones that actually believe and worship the one true God. I believe that's what God is doing right now on the face of this earth, is he is sending out the loud cry so that anybody, everywhere, all over the world will have an opportunity to actually come away from idolatry and will be able to worship the one true God, not the beast and his image, rather the father and his image, right? So we have here in this section that you need to sit silent and get into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. I was wroth with my people, I have polluted mine inheritance, and I have given them, my people, into your hand, O daughter of Chaldeans. Thou didst show them no mercy upon the ancient. Hast thou heavily laid thy yoke? You were not treating them well, and that's why Revelation 18 says that they will receive double for all the things that they had and had done. Thou saidst, I shall sit a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. You thought that these things are going to be yours and you're going to be like, you know, treated as a queen and everything, just like it says in Revelation chapter 18. In fact, I think I can remember where it is. Revelation 18 verse, I think it's six. Oh, that's the reward her as she rewarded you and double because of what she had done because of course her iniquities have reached unto heaven it's the way that she's treated god's people here it is how much she has glorified herself she has lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her because she said in her heart i am sitting uh, as a queen i have a throne and i'm not a widow i will see no sorrow or i will see no loss of children what did you we just read I shall sit as a lady or a queen. I will have a throne. So that you did not lay these things to your heart, neither did you remember. If you just study this section, like all of Isaiah 47 with Revelation 18, you'll be able to realize like, wow, there's a lot that's going on here. Oh, here it is. This is where it is. 
she has said in her heart, just like in Revelation 18, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, just like it says here in Revelation 18. I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow. I will see no sorrow or loss of children, back over in Isaiah 47. I shall sit I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children, or I will not know sorrow, right? And so this verse is very similar to Revelation 18, verse 7. It says there in verse 9 of Isaiah 47, But these two things shall come to thee in a moment, in one day. Okay, you can see that in Revelation 18 it talks about a short time, half an hour and, and various times like that. The loss of children and widowhood. These are the things that will happen to you, but guess what? Remember it says, uh, I have given my children into your hand, right? So mm, there's only a remnant that's going to be saved, like though the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the Bible says, only a remnant will be saved. In fact, Isaiah is the one that said that, and Paul quoted Isaiah saying that. It says, in a moment, you're going to be losing children and you're going to lose your husband. And that's why it talks about in like Revelation 18, verse 23, I think it is. Revelation 18, 23. It says, the voice of the bridegroom shall no more be heard at all in thee. Which, of course, I think is the voice of Christ and the bride, which is the, the church. But the voice of the bridegroom will not be heard anymore. Why? Because she will have widowhood and she will lose her children. Babylon is not going to go through a good experience. We don't want to be the children of God that have been forsaken and put into the hands of Babylon. We need to come away from sinfulness, away from transgression, away from idolatry. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy what? Sorceries. Wait a minute. Revelation 18.23 says that by your sorceries were all nations deceived. Now, in the New Testament, this word sorceries actually means pharmakia. It's medication. Pharmakia. If you didn't know this, by the way, you need to study this one. The whole world right now, the entire world, is under the deception of pharmakia. There is this poisonous virus, this, this thing called COVID-1984 that's going around the world and everybody has been fearful and deceived and they're all going to be vaccinated as a result of this pandemic. It's pharmakia. This is what's being described in the Bible in Revelation 18.23. That one little word that is talked about having deceived the entire world, it is being fulfilled right before your eyes. And that's what's happening here in the Bible. It's saying pharmakia in the New Testament. It's saying in the Old Testament that by your sorceries, okay, because of the multitude of your sorceries. Now, this is a different word because it's Hebrew. It's dealing with witchcraft or magic, but that's the same idea. Like medications started back in the days with sorcerers and various potions being put together and the, you know, lizard tail and the belly of a bat or whatever you mix together, all those kind of weird potions that they had in those stories, whatever, but it's sorcery, okay? It's witchcraft. And for the great abundance of your enchantments, and so this is sorcery as well, okay? They're dealing with the black and dark magics of this world. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. So wait a minute, didn't God say that just a few verses earlier? I am and there is none like me? Well, guess what? Babylon in its false godness is doing or saying the same identical thing. They're claiming to be able to heal with their sorceries and their enchantments. Just like God the Father has healed because he is the one true God, he's done it through his son. Well, they're trying to do their healings through their uh, agents as well, and it's not working. They're trying to set up a false God system in this world, and God is not going to allow it without crying out against it. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, because you're claiming to be the one true God, but you're not. Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall befall, or shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation 
shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Just like Jesus had said to the children of Israel, which would given into the, which had basically been given into the hands of quote unquote Babylon during its day. Really, it was Rome. He said, your house is left unto you what? Desolate, right? Desolation shall come upon you suddenly, just as quickly as Christ had said it, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. You've always had these sorceries, these enchantments. You've always tried to deceive people with your pharmakia in the new modern Babylon. If so be thou shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. Go ahead, stand now with your stuff. See if that will bless you or bring you through. It won't. This is kind of like, I can't remember the phrase, but it's a type of wording that's being used here that we can know that he's saying it, but he's meaning like it's not going to work. Verse 13, thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now your astrologers, your stargazers, your monthly prognosticators, let them stand up and save you from these things that shall come upon you. Will they? Can they? No, the answer is no. They, they're, they're not going to be able to. In other words, you stand up, it won't work. Let those who are around you stand up, it won't work. Verse 14, Behold, they shall be as stubble. Where do you learn about stubble? Well, you just go to Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, and you can read about how the proud will be as stubble. They will be burnt up. It will leave them neither root nor branch. The fire shall burn them up. In fact, I'm just going to go there and read it since I've referred to it. Malachi 4, verse 1, Behold, the day cometh, that shall burn as an oven. Yea, all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, even the idolaters, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Just in case you didn't know this, Christ is the root and his people are the branches. Well, guess what? Satan is the root and his people are the branches. And so it's saying it will leave them neither Satan nor any of his followers. They are going to be destroyed. Okay, so let's go back to Isaiah 46. They shall be a stubble, it will burn them up. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame, like God did with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were delivered from the flame. And remember, even Isaiah 43, I think it is, the first couple of verses says that the you will walk through the water, it will not overcome you. You will walk through the flame, but it will not burn you, right? So God is saying, I can do that for you, but Babylon's not able to do that for you. And so this great warning about who it is as a God that you trust, it will really have an effect on your future, right? And so it says, There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before. Why? Because it's going to burn you. You're gonna, there's, nobody is going to be there to be warmed at the coal or sit in front of the fire. It's going to consume you. It says there in the last verse, Thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants. Now the merchants of the earth are really upset in Revelation 18. You can do that study for yourself. And just the same way in Isaiah 47, the merchants of the earth were really upset because Babylon was a false system that they trusted in. They trusted in Babylon as merchants, as though Babylon were able to provide for them, to protect them, to give them water and shelter, and to continue uh, allowing them to live, etc. All these things that God has promised to do, Babylon has promised to do. But the merchants of the earth are upset with Babylon because she didn't come through with her promises. And in the same way, Babylon today, the spiritual Babylon, is not going to come through with its promises either, her promises, and that's why the merchants of the earth are upset with her in Revelation 18. So there's a lot of parallel with the fall of Judah and how God has given his people into the hands of the Babylonians and how the Babylonians are going to be destroyed with everybody with them. And it's the same way at the end of time how God's people, Israel, if you will, have been given into the hands of the Babylonians. Why? Because they worship the same God. Bel and Nebo are not the true God. Bel is the false God and Nebo is the false prophet. You have a false father and a false son. You have the beast and his image instead of the father and his son, the true God in his image. And so we have this whole scenario in Isaiah as it is today. The same things are happening and we need to realize that repentance, turning away from sin, getting away from those things that are contrary to God's word is what he has called us to do. 
may it be so in our lives. And so I'm going to go and finish the last verse here. Thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored. It's going to happen. Everybody who's worked together with Babylon, it's going to be the same way. Even your merchants from your youth, they shall wander every one to his quarter. None of this shall save you. So it's saying right here, none shall save you. No matter what it is, if it's Bel, if it's Nebo, if it's Ashtaroth, if it's uh, Baal, you know, depending on the names, whatever God it is, if it's a false God, if it's not the one true God that has a son of the Bible, it is not going to save you. Babylon will be destroyed. The foundation of Babylon is a false God that has built up a false system. We need to come out of her, my people. And so may it be that God gives us the wisdom and the skill to study the Bible for ourselves. And may he direct us by his spirit to be able to come to an understanding that is consistent with the truth so that we will be able to share this message with the world and that as many as people as will will come to repentance and be, be prepared for the coming of God's son, Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory. I want that for me and I want that for you. Let's pray and ask for God's blessings as we seek for this in our daily lives. Lord of heaven, I'm asking that you would please continue to have mercy upon us as we are wanting to know what the truth is from your word. We have seen in Isaiah 46 and 47 that you have rebuked idolatry again. You have said of your people, they were given into the hands of the Babylonians. And you have said only a remnant will be saved in the same book, just a few chapters earlier. We pray that you would help us to take heed to your word, to understand what it is that you're saying and to be blessed in all of these things. I pray that you would help us to know and understand what it is that your spirit is teaching so that we can be transformed. You've said you will give us a new spirit. You will give a new heart that you will put within us, and that this new heart, this new mind, the renewing of our mind, will be just what you want. Let us have the same mind that was in Christ to be in us, and let that mind direct every action, every step, every thought, every word, every act, every emotion. We thank you for this, praying for true and thorough conversion, wishing for this in preparation for your son's coming, so that we can be tools used of you to help many other sons to come unto glory. We thank you for this and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so if there are any comments, I would be very thankful to hear them. I have a uh, question for you, Daniel. Yes, sir. Uh, I've heard two different things here uh, at one point in time or another, and maybe you can help me understand. Uh, talking about the councils between the father and the son, uh, Mrs. White said that uh, uh, they met three times. The son kept on going in and uh, trying to convince the father. I believe that's what she says, uh, that uh, he should take on this burden. And then I also heard that the father made the decision that uh, he called his son in and says, uh, I'm gonna ask you to do this. Um, with, with your experience and what you have read over the past many years, uh, uh, how do you believe that took place? You know, I, I really wish I knew like the, chrono the chronology of it, the chronological activities of the Council of Peace. I don't. I think that what we have is not just the son coming to the father. We don't just have the father talking to the son. I think the councils were longer than just one person interacting with the other. And so we have it seems to me in this interaction of the father and the son a conversation that was held it was actually a meeting like the father had a couple of thoughts the son came to the father several times the father may have responded and so it's it seems like depending on which section you're coming from or what perspective you're coming from it helps to me build the story rather than try to narrow it down to just one or the other does that make sense yeah Okay. Yes. All right. Good. Yes. And uh, I was also wondering if you could explain uh, chapter 46, verse 11 to me, please. Let I me did just... not understand that verse at all. 
Isaiah 46, 11. I don't know if I can understand it, but I'll try. Okay, yeah, okay. so God is going to, so my counsel will stand, I will do all my pleasure. I'm going to call somebody from the east. Who came from the east? Well, the Assyrians came from the east toward uh, Israel, and then the Babylonians came from the east to destroy Judah. And so calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executes my counsel from a far country, I believe that what we're seeing is a bird being referred to as the man, which is the, uh, the Babylonian system to the Judeans that were here being talked to. Yea, I have spoken it, I will bring it to pass. So it seems like the ravenous bird would be here referred to as the Babylonians and the okay, man that great. executes counsel. Yeah. That, that's what I was kind of thought, but I wasn't sure. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. We see Isaiah 47, 11 being echoed also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 7. So you know what? I'm going to look that up. Isaiah 47, 11 and 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 through 5. He says, Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's basically uh, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. Good. As travail upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. Good. Yeah, I like that. Darkness will overtake them, etc. Good thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, Isaiah is a new book to me again, he says, and it is to me too. I have really come to love the book of Isaiah. It covers so much. And I'm, I know I'm missing more than half of it. I'm sure that if I knew what was happening in the local area at the time better, I would know and understand more about the book of Isaiah. But I'm trying to apply it more to us today as it seems very relevant. My wife had just mentioned something. Maybe I can talk about sorceries and pharmacia a little bit more because some medications are helpful yes and my my bad i have actually gone over that in the past perhaps my wife wasn't here during that time and and maybe you weren't either so I, it's good to explain there are medications that are necessary so some people literally live because of them and and we can appreciate that and there are lots of medications that can be helpful now um I couldn't go over the list in my mind. I certainly haven't done that study, but there are some things that, that are necessary. Now, would it be best to get away from those if possible? The answer is yes. Why? Because the enemy is trying to do everything he can to get us addicted to different things. If we are addicted to something at the end of time where the mark of the beast scenario is set up where you can't buy or sell except you have the mark of the beast and your physical body is craving for something that you're addicted to, you're going to likely, because of your physical cravings, fall into receiving the mark of the beast as a result of being able to buy or sell. And so that's why it's important that we try to understand this. But are some medications necessary and applicable? Yes, I would have to say yes. But is it possible that maybe with the change of diet and lots of waters and sunlight and the various natural remedies, maybe herbs and whole foods diet, juicing and, and various types of things like that, maybe you... It may, could it be possible that you could get away from some medications by not using as many? Yes, that's maybe possible. Again, speak to somebody who's more intelligent about that than I am in your situation, and you'll be able to find and understand that better. So I'm not saying you have to be away with all medications, but I'm saying that there is a real danger in being addicted to things because I think the Mark of the Beast scenario with this whole, you need to either wear a mask or you can't buy or sell, you need to have a vaccination potentially, or in some situations, or you can't buy or sell. You need to um, show up to church on Sunday or you won't be able to buy or sell. You know, where are we gonna go with this? This is the mark of the beast scenario being set up. And we need to realize that we're, we're real close to the end of time. We don't have a lot more that needs to be happening. And so uh, let's take it seriously. My, my wife had something to say here. She wrote it down and she said, maybe the word dependent rather than addicted might be more correct, okay? The word addicted might make it seem like it is a choice whereas some can't choose. Okay, like yourself, uh, Gina, I don't know that you're choosing to keep that medication in your body, um, but you kind of have to, like you're dependent on it. So it might seem like it's a choice whereas some people can't choose. 
as they would die or be seriously ill without certain medications. Yes, thank you for that clarification, love. Appreciate it. May God keep us faithful. Amen.